It makes it easy sometimes to get up and preach after uh, you feel like you've already been to church, if you know that term. Man, God is good and faithful. My confidence is in God's faithfulness, not my own. Friends, it's good to be with you. My name is Pastor Dan. I should have introduced myself earlier, one of the pastors here. We've been walking through uh, the book of Joshua, talking about transitions. Well, it was a few years ago, and just a few short days after my grandmother passed away, my parents called me in the midst of that transition, and they told me that they thought I had the need, that out of the five of their kids, I had the greatest need of a new car. I don't know what that says about me, but it was true. And grandma decided that whichever grandson or grandkid needed a car the most, they would get the car. So they called me, said, Dan, you're getting grandma's car. I'm like, yes, because I knew my, my grandma drove fast and take, took chances. So this was going to be fun. And that her car was always immaculate. So I knew I was inheriting something great. Um, here's a picture of it. Um, and if you, yeah, hey. If you live in Flint, Michigan, at some point in your life, you get to drive a Buick, right? You with me, Wayne? So I got that car. I still drive that car. It's a 2004 Buick LeSabre. I drive grandma's car. It's, and it's a privilege because this is like carrying on her legacy. Now, I don't take quite the same care of it that grandma did, but hopefully she's still proud of uh, the miles that are put on that car. But I got to tell you, grandma's legacy isn't confined to the, to the LeSabre. What I also remember about Grandma is going to her house, there were always gummy bears and Reese cups. She had those little glass jars that must have been from that era that you pull out the suction of it, and inside, the gummy bears were still fresh. And my younger brother and I, John, he, his drug of choice was the Reese cups, and so he pulled those out, and it seemed no matter what we did, it was always refilled somehow. But she did that to show us love in a language we would understand. But she did more. She also learned, or taught me how to play euchre to share her love with me. But even more than that, Grandma, I remember when we had our, our kids and they were little infants, Grandma loved holding our kids. And she loved taking care of those that were most vulnerable. And in these, though, you've, if you've been there before, you know in each one of these moments that are her legacy, there is a sacrifice, a cost. Someone had to pay for the gummy bears and the Reese cups, right? To give up her seat in a game of euchre meant her team was probably going to lose. Grandma didn't like that. But she did it because she wanted to pass on her love to the next generation of card players. And third, when... You take care of infants when you're there at a family reunion. You don't get to see everyone very much. And the baby starts crying. Grandma would willingly take the young one and have to leave the room, though, and miss what was going on. Because sometimes when you show love, it requires a sacrifice. I, when I think of the, those moments or any moment when I've been in transition— when I'm not where I want to be, when something has changed the direction of my life, when I've yet to get to where I want to get, I often start thinking back and recalling where I've been. Anyone else like that? When transitions happen, you start remembering and recalling and thinking about legacy. We remember people's intentional moments of care for us. We remember the unintentional moments, the silly, the sacred, sacrifices that are made. We remember people's legacy. I'm also thinking in just a couple days, we will remember 17 years ago, 9-11 happened. And one of the, the images that I remember so fondly from that day was while everyone was running away from the towers, the women and men who were the first responders were running to the towers, putting their life on the line. Their sacrifice inspired people to sign up to be first responders so the legacy of sacrifice spurred on legacy of sacrifice. Today, when we talk about transitions, we're going to talk about what it means to leave a legacy of sacrifice. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, come, we need you. We all came in this room today with our week's worth of baggage. Whether we know it or not, God, it's here with us. And so, God, we just for now set it down and say, God, teach us. God, form us. God, shape us into your image so that others 
may know you. Now open your word to us, God, that we may be hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Friends, we are still in transition, right? I haven't met you all, some of you yet. Some of you are gone for the summer. This is only my fifth week with you. We are still figuring out where we're going to go. Our text this week finds us with the people of God once again still in transition. If you got your Bibles, go to Joshua chapter 1. We're going to start down in verse 13. If you got your phones, pull out you version. Go to Joshua 1. God is preparing his people, Israel, to go into the land that he promised them. In the first part, the last three weeks, we heard all about God speaking to Joshua, speaking to Joshua, speaking to Joshua, the new leader. Their leader had, had died, and now Joshua was asked to be the new leader. But in our text today, Joshua now starts to speak to the people, but he's only speaking to three tribes, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and Manasseh. Verse 13 says, Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, The Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. So he starts out telling them, Remember, remember. Now, you, you, there's some deal that was made earlier. Remember that the Lord God said he'd give you this rest, but he's about to tell them what they have already agreed to. If you're curious, this whole passage comes from Numbers 32. One of the other books of the Bible, you can turn there if you want. There's the only two places I'm going to take you today. Joshua 1, Numbers 32. In there, the Reubenites and the Gadites, who had very large herds and flocks. Our translation today might be flat screens and beamers. Okay? Seriously, that is, it is an affluent set of tribes. He's, they come to him... They saw that the land of Jazer and Gilead were suitable for livestock, so they came to Moses and Eleazar, the priest, and said, and to the Israelites of the community, and said, the Lord God subdued before the people of Israel the land. It's suitable for livestock. Ooh, and your servants have livestock. So if we found favor in your eyes, they said, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Do not make us cross the Jordan. Across the Jordan, that is the promised land, the place that they've been wandering for 40 years to get into. So they're on the edge of it, and these three tribes come to Moses and the priests at the time and said, the land we're in is kind of nice. And it's really good for people with lots of livestock. And guess what? We've got lots of livestock. So why don't we stay here? Don't make us cross over the Jordan River. Here's what it looks like on a map. And I think there's still spots for the Israel trip. If you've never been, is there, are there spots? No? Yes? Okay, there's still spots. If you want to go to Israel, you can see this firsthand. I know it's hard to see. All you need to see is there's a little gray box at the bottom. That's the Dead Sea. Straight up from that is the Jordan River. Okay? They were on the east side of the Jordan when this text is happening. But God was going to move them across the river but you'll notice on the top right, you see Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben. Those are the three tribes. They did not want to cross the Jordan. They wanted to stay where they were. In Numbers 32, Moses responds to their request. He says, should your fellow Israelites go to war while you sit here? He goes on to say a lot more things about them, not very nice. Even verse 10, it said that the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. Moses tells them later on that they've been selfish and short-sighted. But they like, whoa, whoa, I think we've been misunderstood. They come back, verse 16. We would like to build pens here for our livestock and cities for our women and children. But we will arm ourselves for battle and go ahead of the Israelites until we have brought them to their place. We will not return to our homes until each of the Israelites has received their inheritance. So Moses says to them, if you will do this, if you will arm yourself before the Lord, and if all of you who are armed cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven his enemies out before him, then when the land is subdued before the Lord, you may return and be free from your obligation to the Lord and to Israel, and this land will be your possession." So are we tracking what happens here? They're in a place they like. They've 
grown to like. It fits their lifestyle. Moses says, what? In the rest of your brothers and sisters are going to go over to war while you sit here in your place of comfort? And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We'll go over first and fight. And then after that, Moses said, then you can go back to your land. So go back to Joshua with me. This is our text for the day. Joshua is reminding them of the commitment that they made. Verse 113, or chapter 1, verse 13. Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, the Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. I love that phrase, giving you rest. That phrase there, that word rest, is, is often described in Scripture as when the earth, the land, is in harmony with what God wants. It's also described in a very human level of when you can, our word might be retire, or when you can kick back and take a deep breath. When there are no more worries, when the outer world and the inner world is at peace. One of the first things I did when I moved up here was we went out to Meyer, and I was amazed because we came from Dayton and Dayton is total OSU territory but when we showed up at Meyer here they had a Michigan chair like a camp chair and so I beelined for it I grabbed it threw it on my back walked it to the front and I envisioned setting it up in my backyard open it up kicking back when I had a day of rest and just going We've been privileged in some of these dinners with the pastor to be in some of your homes. And it's always amazing to see that some of you have cultivated some incredible spaces where you can, at the end of a long day or on your weekend, you can sit back and just breathe. That's that word, rest. It's the same word used in the Ten Commandments about why we all should practice Sabbath. Because... Exodus 20, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, all that is in him, and he did what? Rested. <sighs> Everything was created the way it was supposed to be created. So God stopped and rested. So Moses tells these three, three tribes, the Lord has given you rest in the land that you asked for. He's given you this peace they wanted to build storage. Remember pens? They wanted to build protection. They wanted to live and breathe in the land most desirable. And so they make a deal to protect their prosperity and their possessions. But it came at a cost. They would be separated from the other tribes. Their possessions separated them from their brothers and sisters. But here's where God is good. I don't think God is a finger pointer as much as he is an inviter and he invites them to something more. He invites them to something more. Verse 14, your wives, your children, your livestock must stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. So you're going to go fight, but those that are most vulnerable are going to be more vulnerable because you're going to go and fight. It's estimated 110,000 men could have been the ones armed for battle from those three tribes. Some of them surely would have stayed back to try to protect the women and kids, but a lot of them would go. Continue in verse 14. But all your fighting men ready for battle must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to help them. Fellow Israelites is often translated brethren or kindred. But it says all your fighting men ready for battle. If you break that word down, you look at it through the other places in the, the scriptures, that description of those people, we might call them shock troops. They were the ones to go on the front line. They were in the very front. They were the ones who were going to be the ones first killed if there were casualties. They would be warriors, the first people on the ground, the first potential casualties. And why? Because he said there's kindred, there's brethren, there's fellow Israelites that you're going to help. That word for fellow Israelites is the same word for brother used in scripture to define Cain and Abel, who are literal blood brothers. Your brothers are going over to this place God has for them, and you're going to help them by being on the front lines. You're going to put your very life at risk. Verse 15, until the Lord gives them rest. 
as he has done for you. And until they have taken possession of the land, your Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. I love this. I mean, they made a deal, but God's reframing it. It's not saying you're going to go over until you give them rest, but the Lord's going to give them rest. So even in their selfishness, God is inviting them to be a part of something the Lord is doing. And what you have, what you're afraid to leave, what you've secured for yourself already, you're going to go until everyone has it, this very same thing for themselves. God invites us into his work to get beyond his self until others have what we have. Verse 16, this is courageous to say. They said, all that you've commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. That's the text. Now let me draw some implications for us today. The people who were going to be on the front lines of this fight were asked to invest in people, in land, in a future for people, and they would never see the result of it. They would be fighting for land that would not be their own. They would be paving a future for people they may never encounter again. They were taught in this moment, you can't forget your brothers. You can't, you might say, it's not right for me to be secure when my family isn't secure. Nor may, nor may we as Christians sit down in the exclusive possession of religious blessing without blessing others. God invites them Help them find the rest that you have. Give your life so that they may breathe. Just like you breathe. That they may have rest like you have rest. Because these are the people from the line of Abraham who when God showed up in his life, he said, you're blessed to be a blessing. Friends, I don't know what you came in with today. But if you're here, I believe, and Ephesians tells us that we've got every spiritual blessing in the church needed. We've been blessed, haven't we? We can come and worship in freedom. Oh my goodness, we're not sitting on something hard, we're sitting on comfy seats. We get a privilege of putting something in the offering every week. Oh my goodness, have we been blessed. Most of us have a car out there. Most of the world doesn't have that. Oh my goodness, have we been blessed. What I want to encourage us to do today in this moment of transition is to move from this natural pull. What, what, what the evil one likes to do in our head and our world is to tell us you deserve it, you own it, it's all your stuff. Hold on to it, protect it, build pens around it. Don't do anything to risk your comfort. And yet God is calling us to take that very thing and say, wait, 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 yes, this is good, this is normal, this is holy, but others don't yet have it. So until they do, I'm going to put myself on the line so that they may have rest like I have rest. I think it's interesting that sometimes in, when you're transitioning in grief, I don't, I don't know how God works this. This is like a paradox, but some of you know this too well. Sometimes when you're the most hurting, the way God lifts you out of that is actually allowing you to serve somebody. I've seen people in hospitals give up their food for the sister in the bed next to them because it makes them feel like they're not insulated. It's not just about them. When we moved here, there's a thousand decisions to make when you move, right? All these things, and after a while, you just start feeling selfish. Like, every decision is about what we need, what we need. And so I'm so thankful for gifts along the way, invitations from God to say, yeah, but you have neighbors. Go serve them. There are people in your church. Go find out what they need. Make decisions on their behalf. God is inviting them in transition to move from insulation to investment. But to do this, friends, you know this already, it takes sacrifice. Sacrifice. They told me I could just shoot straight with you all at Grace Church, right? There's, there's no other way to put it. If, if I want my grandkids to tell stories of gummy bears and Reese cups, I'm going to have to go buy gummy bears and Reese cups. And we sacrifice our time. Our time. What if you spent time with people that you may never see what they do with it? You may never step into the land 
that they are going to walk in. Or maybe our money. I deeply believe the idea of being generous is not God saying, I need your money, you selfish jerks. It's God trying to free us from the sins of greed, the sins of false power and security and insulation. It's an opportunity for me to say, this doesn't own me. This is all God's. Sacrifice with our hands. Blessed to be a blessing. Serve people with what you can do with your hands. And finally, with our stories. With our stories. I think that's one of the greatest ways we don't even think about how we can sacrifice for others. When my wife's grandma was dying, she's the matriarch in the, in the family of faith. She was facing dementia, but she had captured a ton of her stories. And I remember the one she told me where her and her husband had nothing in the cupboards. Nothing. No more. Even, even the ramen noodles were gone, right? And she had three kids, and they realized they were not going to be able to provide dinner for them. So when you're that desperate, you know what you do? They literally got on their knees, and they just prayed and said, God, we don't know how we're going to feed our kids. And before the prayer was done, someone knocked on the door and said, I'm supposed to bring you a meal tonight. The time she took to tell us that story has inspired me and will inspire me for a lifetime. Sacrifice your time, your money, your hands, your story for those who are not yet aware of the God that you know. For those that don't have peace, we sacrifice our time. For those who don't know love, we sacrifice our money. For those who don't know forgiveness, we sacrifice with our hands and we go serve them. Because if they don't have rest, my rest isn't worth anything. Because we're Jesus people. Jesus, who was fully God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but instead took the very nature of a servant and died for people. And get this, many of them, many of them would deny his sacrifice, but he sacrificed anyway. This is what we do. Sometimes people would take advantage of your gifts. Yep, but it's what we do. Sometimes you serve and no one says thank you. Yep, but that's what you do because you're a Jesus follower. He left luxury. It had a cost, his very self. That's why this week you bake cookies. And instead of eating them, you bring them to Kairos. That's why you go and see Tiffany later and say, I do not want my money to be my God anymore. I'm going to support you so that you're fully supported. When you put money in the offering, this is so cool. I like money. I want to hold on to all that I want to, Right? But I also know like when there's hurricanes or, or some of the threats of the storm coming, the United Methodist Church is already on the ground now waiting. The money you put in, a portion of that goes to fund those missionaries all around the world right now. You're not putting money in an offering. You're changing lives around the world. To move from insulation to investment requires sacrifice. But friends, this is what we do. This is what we do. So I want to give you a direct challenge this week. The word brethren or kindred in the New Testament is often translated neighbor. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan, maybe? Who is my neighbor? I want you to think of your literal neighbor, the one that drives you nuts, that doesn't mow the lawn enough, right? I want you to find a way to sacrifice for them this week. You got it? We good? If nothing else, it helps us practice what this is that we preach. What's a way you can sacrifice so that they would know that they are worth loving? What's a way you can sacrifice your time, your money, your hands, or your story so that your literal neighbors may know the God that you know? As the band comes up, let me pray a commissioning and ascending over you today. God, it's not just baking cookies. It's not just fighting a war for others. We do this in response to your gracious act of love and mercy. You were the ultimate shock troop who was on the front lines and said, if you want to get to them, you get to me first. God, may you position and pattern our lives in a similar way until all of those have rest. May it be so in the name of Jesus. Amen.